So I hope to um, talk about things that are completely different than all the previous talks on this conference. So who am I? I'm, like I said, like um, John said, I'm on the ACA team. I'm also working on the reactive stream specification where I did the, the test, um, technology compatibility kit. And other than that, here's a bunch of community things I run in Krakow. So I founded the Lambda Lounge, which you may have heard of, or the Scala User Group, among other hackers around here who are sitting here, Adam and Rafa. And of course, I also run the annual GeekCon conference with the Java User Group. So, uh, that's me, but I do need a little bit of information about you guys so I know what I can compare stuff with. So, who is a Erlang guy? We have Erlang people. Okay, that's kind of weird, I was expecting more. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, if they claim they don't need this stuff, that's, that's their fault. Okay, do we have uh, Scala people? Okay, most of the scholar people. That's good. It's it's amazing that finally we have so many scholar people. I mean, wh when I started doing scholar in Krakow, it was basically me and another guy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's good that we have more. So uh, this talk will be about performance and the not human sympathy part of computer systems. So uh, unlike like the previous keynote, um, happiness is of little concern to me and to this talk. And there will be sweat, there will be blood, and there will be mutability. <laughs> so um, this is a great quote from Martin Thompson, performance guy, that performance is not about bit fiddling. Okay? If you go to a Google interview, they ask you bit fiddling questions, just do a face poll, man. What, what, what are you asking me about? Okay? Performance is not bit fiddling. I mean, you can save a bunch of milliseconds sometimes, maybe. But performance is about really design principles and thinking about interactions of stuff. And this is what we'll be going to talk about here. Uh, this is the agenda. Um, you may recognize some of the words, some of them you may not recognize. My goal here is to present a top-level over overview uh, what this stuff is, why we need it, and why even if you think you're not using it, you're actually using it in your day-to-day -day work. So the goal is to, well, inspire you to look into these things. Uh, if you feel sleepy, I do highly recommend breathing in or standing up and waving around your arms whenever you need, because this stuff will be quite heavy and it would be a waste if you fall asleep or lose track at some point. So feel free to wave your arms or whatever to, to not fall asleep. Not wasting any time. Uh, here's another list of stuff we'll talk about. We'll talk about concurrent access to shared mutable state side effects, locks, no locks, and lots of other horrible stuff, including assembly code. Yes. And there's going to be a lots, of, lots and lots of stigma illustrating all this stuff. Um, the reason this is here at this conference and on this React track, the reason we need all this stuff is to gain performance. And even if your high-level abstractions, apps, whatever, are purely functional, somewhere down below, someone needs to do this stuff. So we'll talk about the internals and how the sausage is made. So firstly, <coughs> I hope this is no news to you guys, but let's talk about what async is. So in synchronous systems, you get a request, you get a reply. You get a request, you get a reply. And this is pretty boring and you can't really do much because you're just sequentially processing these messages. Of course, I'm talking here, and this is usually, you can think of whenever I draw a stickman, it can represent a thread, a process, an actor, but it's usually this one thing of computation. Um, and in synchronous systems, we can say, yeah, here's a message, and here's another message, and then <coughs> even before responding to the first message, we can do something with the second one, because we already know it's wrong, for example, so I can respond right away. <coughs> and then maybe there's a third message, and I reply first to it, and then I reply to the first message because it took the longest time to process. Easy, right? So let's talk about internals of scheduling. So what is scheduling? Scheduling means I have some processing power. Let's say I have two cores or two whatever is able ex to execute code, right? It needs to be allocated to some of these actors to actually progress, do things, right? So I can't do more than, in this example, two things in parallel. We're not talking about 
acting as if I am parallel about actual parallel execution. So, in this case, we have three actors, they have mailboxes, these things are mailboxes, and actors work like that, they pick a thing from the mailbox and start processing it. So this guy picks this processor, this guy picks this processor, and they process. Here we got time, right? This means that here, this actor is unable to progress because there's no compute power available, right? Easy. So at the end of processing of each message, there's an opportunity for someone to be scheduled, right? So here we have no CPUs, but at the end of each processing, when I'm done processing a message, I can reschedule <coughs> some other guy. So there's two potential opportunities that this guy will get some CPU time. Okay, he got lucky, he got the yellow CPU, he's happy in processing the message, and the blue guy is continuing to process other messages. So now the middle guy cannot progress because we don't have processing power for him. And then maybe we have some two interesting things here. The down actor is doing some synchronous I.O. to some database, some disk, and this thread is basically wasted. Okay? That's a terrible thing to do. But from the middle actor's perspective, it doesn't really matter if this is happening, so someone doing something stupid and blocking a thread, or if he's just unlucky and didn't get CPU time because the other actor won again and got the CPU to progress by doing his things. And then, yes, finally we return, and here's an opportunity for the middle guy to get some CPU time in there. So what I want to highlight here is if I'm only the middle guy, I don't really care if someone is blocking or simply luck, very lucky with getting compute power. Right? It's the same effect. I'm unable to progress. So how does async come in? So async comes in that if I have to do some call, instead of blocking that thread, I can perform asynchronous I.O. Then I can give up this thread. This guy can progress. And then, once this database, or disk, or whatever, returns, I'll, I'll get some event, I'll get notified, and I can then handle this event again, right? So, in, in event-based systems, we try to maximize the number of not wasting time. A great thing is wasting time. So, instead of wasting time waiting, I can just signal the intent of I will continue doing stuff if, if you are done, right? By you, I mean the database this time and give up the thread so someone else can progress. So, uh, in general, these systems aim to minimize latency. Okay, what is latency? Latency is the time interval between stimulating and getting some response, right? In the broadest sense, at least. So, now a quiz. I'll try to interact with you a little bit so you don't fall asleep after lunch. So, question. is a 10 second latency acceptable in your application, in your day-to-day -day work. I mean, hands up if it is. Okay. There are systems where 10 seconds is fine, right? There are systems where three days is fine. I mean, some bank transfers take three days and somehow we think that's acceptable. <laughs> okay. Well, historical reasons, right? We, we kind of think that's acceptable sometimes. But yeah, maybe it's 200 milliseconds fine. Okay, more hands. Okay. Okay, that's the thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> finally someone got it. Okay, so, um, so how about mostly, mostly 20 millisecond requests? And, one, and sometimes, like twice a day, you get a one minute before you get a response. Like maybe some systems, but it's fine. And do people die when the latency is above 200 milliseconds? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you probably need a real-time system, right? A proper real-time system, not a soft, squishy, GC-based system, right? So all these questions are more or less detached from any context. And if you're happily raising your hand, oh, yeah, this is fine, you're probably, uh, I don't know, answering too quickly. Um, so what you usually would like to say about latency is, yeah, so most, like 90% has to be below something, 99% uh, has to be below a second, and the 99th percentile has to be below two seconds, otherwise we are out of business. For example. So you always need context about these things. And sometimes big latencies are fine. And important thing, if you just measure the average latency, and then, if you're better, uh, you're also measuring the uh, standard deviation, and then 
if someone comes around and asks you, yeah, so what's the 99th percentile? Do not apply mathematics and statistics to this thing. Why? Because just from maths, you can calculate the 99th percentile. And when you use normal distribution, you draw a graph, you look, oh yeah, I have this and this latency on the 99th percentile. Well, great, but this does not apply because latency is not distributed like normal distribution. It's very spiky, very, very weird. You cannot apply normal statistics like book statistics to this thing. If you didn't measure the 99th percentile, you cannot say anything about the 99th percentile. Because maybe you have this horrible huge spikes. And the average is still very good. Right? So here's a better way to measure latency in systems. Here we have a histogram. But here we have the percentiles. And here we have the latencies. And the yellow thing is some SLA. So here you see, oh, here I'm over my SLA. I'm, I have trouble here. I do not need to optimize my best cases. I do need to optimize this thing. And also you see, this system has two kinds of behaviors. Well, three. Here's, OK, super happy case. No one cares about that. Here's, OK, some kind of behavior. And here's some critical point where the system starts to behave differently. So these are the important points you want to measure and investigate why exactly at this point the system is starting to behave differently. So you should investigate these things, try <laughs> to match up with something. <coughs> yeah, I do recognize this pattern, it looks like a snake. And then, then after you uh, look even more into it, you recognize, oh yeah, I, I remember in our system we have this elephant thing. And this elephant thing starts somewhere around here. I mean, the elephant thing would usually be some buffer size or some latency to some external resource. But you do have to correlate how the system is behaving to whatever the code is doing. So you need to investigate the so-called la tail latency. By tail, we mean the right side of the graph. OK. Now let's jump to different topics, because the general idea of this talk is to jump through all the layers of such a system, coming from yeah, just measuring stuff, then some concurrency stuff, which I'm going to talk about right now. And we'll end up with some clustering things. So. <coughs> Uh, concurrent versus log-free versus weight-free. So, any of you familiar with weight-free algorithms? Good. No one. Well, three people. Uh, not good, but good that I'm showing this one. Uh, so, co a concurrent data structure is basically anything that can not do wrong things when accessed by multiple threads. Right? Uh, this also means that this is fine. But A tries to write by A and B and C, I mean threads here and still tries to write, still tries to write. It's somehow not winning. <coughs> so what does that mean if A never wins? Does that mean that the algorithm is not a concurrent algorithm? Well, it is. It's just that Fred A is a complete loser. Um, and this is fine. This is fine because always, I mean, someone wins. It's, it's still progressing, right? And it didn't yield some weird results. So we didn't have A tries to write, B tries to write, uh, sausage comes out, right? It's still some expected result. So it's a safe concurrent algorithm. Uh, but thread A may never make progress. Looks like it at least. And this also could happen, but um, it could take a lock, and somehow it took the wrong lock, mm -hmm. and it just deadlocks forever. This is, well, not good, but it can happen. Okay, next thread A is still a complete loser because he took a lock. Don't take locks. Um, so, how does a queue API look like normally in such a data structure? So we can offer and we can get a, uh, information if it was able to put stuff into the queue or not. So it's going to be a success or failure. It can throw an exception if it was unable to f insert something into the data structure. Or, worst of all, it, it can wait until it finally inserts the thing into the data structure. This is horrible, okay? Don't. But this is still valid. Let's talk about log free then. Uh, so log-free data uh, structures look mostly somehow like that. So the goal is to, without any synchronization, so there's no, no red or green light, we do want to keep progressing, right? No one is really stopping, no one is really stop slowing down even. But see, the, the data structure is still progressing, even with people inside. So this is what uh, lockless programming looks, looks like. And it also means that any thread is guaranteed to progress 
after some time. So it will not spin forever. I mean, in the previous example, it could take a log and never be woke up again. In lockless, if there's no logs, it will keep spinning and trying to write until it wins. Uh, these algorithms looks like, look like that. So we take the queue, it's an immutable queue, and we have an atomic reference to it. Um, <coughs> then I insert my thing and want to swap it. So this operation is called uh, compare exchange. Uh, that's actually an assembly instruction that's supported by processors. So this is not something we can magically invent and simulate. This actually has to be done on the processor level. And the processor will try to ex compare the given value, so the queue, the, the value that I've saw, um, I saw this value, right, get, then I append it to it, and I expect that no one between these three lines has edited the queue. It's still the same queue. So I want to compare that what is in this black box is still what I got out, and I want to put in my appended thing. And I will continue doing this until I'm successful. Okay, so retry, 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 retry. At some point, I will win this race, because this is effectively racy code, and someone, always one thread, will win this compare exchange. Um, here's a small visualization. Both take the queue, both append something to the queue. <coughs> here's a compare and set that wins, right? Because the blue ones didn't uh, yet write. And here the blue one loses the race, because here the, the data structure was already compared and set, and now it's yellow, gray, 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 right? So it loses the race, but when it tries again, now no one did another write, so it wins the race with, well, in this case, no one. So this is log-free uh, log algorithms. And the third kind of algorithms is weight-free. So weight-free, let's look at the formal definition. It says that, that every operation has a bound number of steps after it will make progress. This means, in the previous example, I could be always losing the race. Could, could be. I mean, in practice it doesn't really happen. You maybe spin four or five times. But in theory, it could happen that you keep spinning like for five years and you never win your right. Could happen. In weight-free algorithms, we uh, have this bound on the number of retries. I am guaranteed to, after this number of retries, to have committed my transaction. Here's a typical code which does that. Um, explanation, if you really want to understand it, here's a paper, it has 30 pages, we're not going to go into that one. I just wanted to highlight there are higher levels of guarantees that we can give than just log plus. Okay, new topic. Like I said, we're going to jump topics up quite a lot. So, I.O. And no, the I.O. monad does not solve this. <laughs> um, but actually, what is I.O.? And what is NIO? And what is zero in this context? So we're going to talk about all of these. So here's a nice quote from Havoc, uh, who's now working at PipeSafe. And I was asking for feedback when I was doing this presentation. And yeah, random thoughts about I.O. in you know, your daily life. So his quote was, when he learned about Java Enterprise in 2008, he's a GNOME guy. So one of the core, core committers of GNOME. And his reaction was, what the fuck is this uh, I.O. crap? Where's the main loop? So really, I.O. that is blocking is not the most natural thing to do for some people. And somehow on the servers, we have grown to, I don't know, be used to blocking I.O. Let's talk about how crappy it is. So you guys know that CPUs have two modes, user mode and kernel mode. Hands up. Good. Many people raise their hands. So we have this user mode, and this is the safe mode where we don't crash the entire computer when we do things wrong. And we have kernel mode where we can basically sec forward the entire system. Right? So I don't really want to be in kernel mode unless I really need high performance thingies and access to random pieces of memory directly. Right? So we normally switch between those, these two modes because here my normal application is running, and here I need to access some driver maybe. Okay? Or I need to access some I.O. In, in this case. So the problem is, uh, switching between these modes is super slow. Because this is a hardware thing. You do have to realize that the processor actually switches modes. It's not a kernel thing. It's re really a hardware thing. And the CPU actually changes how it executes stuff. 
So this takes, well, depending on processors, nowadays it's quicker, but I found, and the links are here below, but it, you don't really see this. Um, well, on a Pentium 4, this thing took a thousand cycles, and that was uh, around a 400 nanoseconds. This is horribly a lot of time, if you want to do any high performance stuff. This is basically a no-go. So how does this uh, come in to play when we talk about I.O.? So when you issue a read, I want to read this file. Then the, uh, the kernel will, will issue the syscall and issue the read in kernel mode. Then it will come back to you, give you back con control into your program. Then you issue the write, because let's say you're implementing a copy. So you want to read one file and write it, its contents to another thing. So then you issue the write right afterwards. So then you have to issue a syscall again, switch this mode again, and again you're switching here from kernel to user. So we wasted around uh, 2,000 nanoseconds here. Not good. Um, well, don't worry, it's going to be getting worse. <laughs> so what about buffers? So buffers is, well, basically, if you read something, you have to put it somewhere. So where do we actually perform the read? Well, there is some disk, for example, and I read it into a kernel buffer. But then, because the kernel cannot safely share this buffer with you, it must copy into user space. OK, so it copies the thing into user space, and then you perform the write. But in order to perform the write, this data has to be in the kernel space. So we copy the entire thing here. So this is three copies of the same data. Not good. And then we finally can write from kernel to TCP, for example. So three copies of the same data, not good. So there's Linux I.O., which is uh, asynchronous I.O., and on the JVM it's new I.O., and it's been new since 2004. So no one calls it new anymore, it's just an I.O. So how it works is you issue this write read request, and you do not lose your thread. The OS will say, yeah, so when I'm done copying this stuff into user land, I will let you know. So then you get this interrupt, and you can then use this buffer. But the amount of copying is still the same, right? It still has to copy between kernel space and this space. So in order to make this smarter, um, the kernel, well, Linux kernel at least, introduced an operation called sendfile. And instead of actually copying this stuff over and over again, it never leaves kernel space, right? I mean, if I just want to transfer data from A to B, I tell the kernel, A kernel, transfer the thing from A to B. And that's what it does. So there's no copying happening here. It is a blocking call, yes, but we are not copying stuff. And copying, of obviously, takes a lot of time. So we are saving time here. Good. Amazing. OK. Let's talk about connections. Anyone heard of the C10K problem? Hands up. OK, not many. So C10K stands for 10,000 concurrent connections. Well, 10,000 doesn't maybe sound horribly much nowadays, but the problem is maybe 10 or 12 years old, from what I researched at least. It was back in the day when Apache was, you know, the new thing, the HTTPD server. And, well, Apache's model is one request, one thread, right? And that's not really scaling up to 10,000 threads. Well, at least back in the day it didn't. Currently, Linux is happy to schedule uh, a few thousand uh, Linux threads, but Certainly not 10,000. So what is the solution to this thing? If I really want to handle 10,000 concurrent at the same time, users hammering my system. Well, you need to go AC. Let's first talk at the, about the well blocking version that was in, in the Linux kernel since forever. And then we'll talk about the non-blocking non event-based version, which is the solution of the C10K problem. So we have a bunch of connections, and let's say these are just sockets, right? You have some file descriptor that is representing the socket. Then the kernel, we can ask the kernel, a kernel, so which socket, which connection has stuff to do? Because that's basically what we want to do. We want to handle the few connections which actually are sending in some requests. Not everyone, right? So, so we poll it, we wait, you know, you can wait, you cannot wait in this example, and then you the kernel will reply to you with a bitmap in which it will mark which of these connections has stuff to do. So you need to scan the entire file descriptors list 
and check, yeah, does it have stuff to do or does it not have stuff to do? The problem with this is, this is ON, right? You get the list and you need to scan the list. Easy. Uh, well, it doesn't really scale if you have tens of thousands and you're performing this. You're trying to perform this as fast as you can because this is only selecting the connection, not even performing work for it. So this really has to be fast. So the solution to this one is um, event, event poll. This is where the name epoch comes came from. So Epoch works a bit differently, so you register a handle for it. In my case, uh, coffee. I don't need coffee. Um, and you register this once, and then you will register these sockets which you are interested in. So you call this uh, Epoch control, watch these sockets. So you register them. And then you do the same thing as previously, but it changes slightly. So you pass in a data structure uh, this is basically an array. Uh, so array, p events, and p size, because in C you have to pass around where the data structure actually ends, right? So, and then the kernel will call you back with the data structure filled in with only these events, where basically marking which sockets are ready to do stuff, and only those. This is a huge difference. You do not have to scan n things, but well, you're scanning exactly these sockets which you have work on. So the algorithm itself is O1, right? It just gives you the thing. So this is already way better. And you can reuse this data structure. This is also good. So the lesson from this one is that ON is a no-go for epic scalability. I mean, if your scalability is five clients, but that's not scalability, right? We want epic scalability. And if you want to go into epic scalability things, sadly, ON is not enough. This is uh, shown in the Linux scheduling systems, where the initial scheduler was also ON because it had to, uh, it had a list of threads, and it was looking, yeah, should I be scheduling this guy now? Maybe not. Should I be scheduling this guy now? Maybe not. It was the same problem. It was a list. Then there was a heuristic-based O1 scheduler, which would just pick stuff well, pick threads to schedule. And currently, there's the completely fair scheduler, which actually selecting the thread to run is O1, uh, but it's sometimes it has to modify this list. Well, it's a tree in this case. So modifying the list of threads is ON in this case. And here in socket selection, we also went from ON to O1. So we're trying to make the things that are really used by everyone, namely the kernel and the sockets, O1 whenever we can. Uh, yeah, that's a moral on this one. And let's talk about the high, high level things. So distributed systems. I'm sure you are familiar with what a distributed system is, but here's the definition I really like by Leslie Lampot. And it's actually a very, very good one. Because a distributed system is a system in which you have many computers and a failure of a computer that you didn't even know existed can render your computer unusable. Which is a good, what is a good example? I'm doing some call to some remote server, and if the remote server is down, well, I won't get the reply. That's the <coughs> easiest example. And this is not a definition, but a very good uh, thing to have in mind, that in distributed systems, uh, the latency profile and the predictability of this thing is yeah, I wouldn't say random, it has some maybe predictable parts, but it, it is certainly more random than just one host. What do I mean by that? I mean, if you have 10 computers, the probability that at, at some point in time, everybody will GC, and just no, no one is responding, is growing with the number of servers you have. So the more servers you have, the more unpredictable interplay comes in, right? Maybe everybody is waiting, Maybe everybody uh, crashes, maybe five people crash, maybe six people crash. You don't know. So it's getting more and more complex the more servers you get. So and let's talk about two techniques which are completely opposite to one, to one each other. So the first technique I want to talk about is backup requests. So let's say we have a system that is um, yeah, plagued by not nice tail latency. And tail latency, if you have a big system and you have um, many requests per second, <coughs> by tail latency in those we mean the 99th percentile. Right? And the thing is, maybe you think 99th percentile, 
if that's a crappy response time, maybe I don't care, right? It's just, I don't know how many requests. But when you do the math and you have a few thousand requests per second, the 99th percentile actually means, oh, so every, every guy on his se every second request has a crappy user experience. So this 99th percentile becomes more and more important the more requests you have, because statistics, right? He will eventually get the crappy response. And we don't want that. So one way to fight tail latencies is to issue duplicated work. This sounds wasteful, it actually is, but it's going to help a lot with meeting our SLAs. So let's say, let's say I have an actor, and let's say I've also distributed, right? And he's getting some query, and the uh, response time has to be below 300 milliseconds or people die. So let's keep it under that. So first I want to ask some guy, I know he has the data, hey, can you give me this data? And I'm already starting a timer that after 100 milliseconds, I will perform the backup request. What do I mean by that? A backup request is sending the same query to other guys which I know they have the same data. I mean, they are also able to serve this request. This is very easy if you have a stateless service, right? Scales naturally. You can just ask anyone from the pool of nodes that are able to answer this question. So you ask other guys, and you get a response from one of them. Maybe you still didn't get a response from the first one. So what this technique is fighting is if we were unlucky in the initial request, and hit a server that was going down, maybe on the heavy load, maybe GC, whatever. It just didn't make it in time. And it turns out that statistically speaking, it helps to issue the second request even if we are 100 milliseconds in already. Because maybe this guy is not under load and can respond fast. And yeah, this guy will also then respond because we issued duplicated work. But I don't really care, I got my response. There are extensions of this algorithm where we can cancel this guy to tell him, yeah, this guy can tell this guy, oh, I got, I got this covered, you don't need to work on this. But these are extensions. The general principle is the same. And here we've met our SLA. Um, so this is a technique actually described by Jeff Dean. Um, I don't know how many years ago, maybe four or something like that. And supposedly they used this technique in the MapReduce and big table systems. And these are some of the numbers for response time from that system. Uh, it's a quote from Achieve from, from this talk. You can look that up. And without these backup requests, the 99th the percentile, 99,9 percentile is getting ridiculous. Right? This is really not good. But even if is with issuing these one backup request, you're fighting the tail latency a lot, right? So even though you're increasing load on the cluster, you're making duplicate work, you're hitting SLAs like, like a champ, right? And here you can see the standard deviation. I mean, that's a, that, that certainly shows how many those worst cases we have just fought. Okay, and now I said I'm going to talk about a completely opposite technique. So combining requests. So combining requests is avoiding duplicated work by aggregating requests. OK, it's completely opposite. Why would I want to increase latency? Because in order to aggregate stuff, I'm going to need to wait for multiple requests to come in. And then I can aggregate those three, for example, and send out one. Why would I want to increase latency? Well, sadly, we are in a world of trade-offs. And this trade-off is trading latency for not killing my downstream servers, perhaps. Maybe my downstream servers are not that powerful, maybe it's just one machine, whatever. So sometimes you need to trade, trade off latency in order to survive load. So this is how it looks. Um, let's say you have this conflate collapse step or, or actor or system, whatever, and it gets three requests. We want to collect these three requests to send in this combined query, for example, to the database. I mean, sometimes it's as easy as if everybody is asking for the same thing, I will just ask for the thing once and then give the answer to those <coughs> three guys. Sometimes it can be more complex that these people are asking for uh, a movie 
but with different IDs, right? But if you have a square database, it's better to issue one query that, you know, you can have the select clause include those three things instead of sending three queries. It depends on your database, but the general idea is like that. So we collect those three, and we want to issue one. Uh, the simplest thing to determine when to send, send out this request is to have a timer. So this also plays nicely if you have a SLA with the backend. And the backend says, you can query me only uh, five times a second. Then you can tune this timer to allow exactly five, these five requests, because that's what the backend does anyway. The other requests will be just killed. So that's an easy technique, and then you send in the request, get the response, you decrease load, but increase latency. So there's a better technique uh, called back, back pressure. So back pressure means that the downstream system, or the, um, yeah, let's call it downstream system, <coughs> has to notify the upstream, so in this case the collapse step, whenever it's ready, or how it is ready to consume requests. Um, this is um, actually a protocol that we have standardized in reactive streams. If you want to get all the details about it, uh, go ahead or ask in the questions section. But in general, it is about the downstream says, I am able to consume five requests. And since this is a synchronous communication, it can keep telling you, I can progress five more, process five more, whenever it just consumed five more. So it has a bound buffer of how many requests it can expect at any given time. So in here, we are waiting for the backend to let us know it's ready to receive this request. And then we, aggregate, we keep aggregating stuff until we, until we get this signal. And then we send this batch. So this is the same idea with aggregating, but the trigger is on the downstream, not on the upstream with some random timer that may or may not be well tuned. Here, this tuning itself automatically, well, not magically, but uh, specifically by knowing how much on the load it is, right? Uh, but the technique is the same. We aggregate and then send over the request. So, I want to wrap up with, well, functional programming is awesome, but none of what I talked about is functional programming. So, the reason is, I mean, somewhere down the line, someone has to bite the bullet and do this mutable horrible stuff. Because we are all running on real machines, it is real hardware, and some instructions have built-in operations in processors. And if you want it to go fast, use the processor, right? And the processor doesn't really care about moments. We do, the processor doesn't. So the trade-off is someone has to bite the bullet, and it's better if a library does it for you. So this is what we do. So Akka is a middleware that applies all these techniques, and then you can keep your high-level code more pure, right? And actually, when you think about Erlang or whatnot, in their case it's the same, but the VM does it for them. Or in our case, the JVM does many things for us here, right? So it's with layers of layers of here it's more mutable, here it's a little less mutable, and then your app can be pure. But someone has to bite the bullet, and sometimes you may need to understand when you need to bite the bullet. Because, oh man, we can't squeeze any more performance out of this moment. Maybe you need to drop out of moment land. Sometimes. I'm not saying you always have to, monos are great, but sometimes you need to. Here's a great example. It's actually from a talk yesterday by Jan Pustelnik, and this is uh, sorting performance. So he benchmark Haskell, uh, Haskell's functional sort implementation, and this is the number of elements in an array, and these are the times how much it took to sort these things. So the three things I want to point out is uh, the C++ plus plus, horrible, mutable way. Uh, let's say, let's compare the one million case. So that's 58 milliseconds. Um, Haskell, purely functional, this is milliseconds, right? Just saying. But <laughs> don't worry, I'm going to complain about Scala more, because here, when we use the pure functional way with monads, we got, this is a buffer second, OK? It's purely functional, but a buffer second to sort an array. But in Scala, we are able to just say, yeah, fuck this, and <laughs> drop down to imperative. And then, you see, we are at 100 milliseconds. So having the option to drop out of purely functional style is a very important thing, and we shouldn't just shun it. 
right? And a very interesting thing, so um, we were talking here on the talk with Jan, so I actually uh, bent the allocations of the ST monad version of this algorithm. So these are the allocation rates of yeah, this algorithm performing the sorting. And these are the numbers and the numbers of instances and how many bytes were allocated. As you can see, this is a gig of map entries allocated in order to sort an array of ints. Okay? So pure coding, great, awesome, but sometimes you need to drop down and do the mutable horrible thing. A uh, funny uh, story, if you have a Scala mutable vector, uh, immutable vector, okay, nice immutable functional data structure, the sorting is actually performed by copying over the thing to an array, performing the mutable sort in the array, then copying it back to the vector, so get a new vector back, and this is still faster than trying to sort an, an, an immutable data structure. And also, this is pure functional, I mean, <laughs> it is, because from the users of the function's perspective, they don't really care if I allocated an array and did the sorting inside there, right? So these mutable tricks are still applicable to pure functional programming, because you don't really care what the function does inside as long as it's not leaking things outside, right? And in this case, we didn't. We just allocated the thing and then we dropped it. So, uh, here is a bunch of links. There's a lot of links. Uh, <laughs> I did my research on this one. Um, specifically, I do want to highlight a few. Specifically, uh, the C++ conference talk about <coughs> juggling razor blades, which is about um, implementing queues. Very interesting talk. And then you realize that any high performance thing you want to implement is basically the same as C. We just leak the C abstractions all the way up if you need any high performance. But one thing I wanted to highlight, and then from Schmucon, a talk about the C10M problem. We talked about C10K, so that's 10,000 concurrent connections, and C10M is 10 million concurrent connections on one box. Um, this isn't really applicable to most of our JDROPs because it involves bypassing the Linux kernel because it's too slow and horrible things like that, but really interesting. And a bunch of other talks. Uh, special thanks to a bunch of uh, people I talked on hallways during conferences and really helped me to get this info. And a little bit of self, self um, yeah, verbum, how do you call it? Uh, advertisements. So, uh, just one line about it. So SCKRK is a reading club. We read computer science papers, many of which uh, influenced this talk. On Krakow Scala, we talk about Scala and Akka things. And on Lambda Krakow, if you're not aware of it, I thought, I mean, this is basically the conference to announce we have this thing in Krakow and you should definitely drop by. So this is what I got. And if you have any questions, we have a little bit of time. You got that for Sorry. You got that Ferrari? No, no. But, uh, but it has Akka on it, so I thought it's awesome. <laughs> I just would like to share my experience when I tried to uh, check how many connections, HTTP connections, I can make on my box. Uh, it was quite simple. It was just a simple C socket server that allowed yeah. to connect and said OK, and he got it, and he closed connection. That was all. And what was very interesting on the next box, then, uh, there were a couple of programs that I tried to use to estimate how many calls I can make, and all of them behaved very weirdly. Sometimes there were problems because some of the connect connections were not answered. So it was very, very weird, especially when I got to about 30,000 connections. Uh -huh. and were you look at, uh, looking at ePool or pool? Uh, no, it, it was just uh, socket, uh, socket um, connect and then send and okay. close. So it was very simple, three, li three lines of programming C. Um, but as I said, it behaved very, 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 very really, uh, under load. But I don't know if the reason was the Linux kernel or maybe programs that had to estimate how many, ta how much time you need for the response. I don't know that. It's just I tried a couple different and they all behave weirdly, weirdly. Really, really. This is a super great example of something I omitted, well, specifically because we would run out of time. So, <coughs> remember the elephant. 
Yes. Uh, the thing about it, if you are measuring any kind of that stuff, <laughs> that kind of stuff, uh, how many how many requests I can handle, whatever, you are being implicitly back pressured. So the benchmarking code, whatever you're using to measure the thing, it's benchmarking itself. It's benchmarking itself yeah. because the, the it's waiting for the socket close and it won't issue another request because you're waiting for the socket close. So we're implicitly back pressuring the the thing that's supposed to measure stuff. So when you measure that kind of low latency things, you usually need to measure outside. So you need, I don't know, five load generators, and they do not measure because they are implicitly back pressured by however the network works because there's TCP buffers, and they won't proceed writing because the buffer is full. So you need a guy from, um, from who from the outside looks at the traffic and he can properly measure them. Um, yeah, lots of interesting techniques for actually measuring the right thing and not what you think you're measuring. Yeah, any questions? Please, uh, first row. Yeah, I, I, you mentioned that the latency is not, we are not able, we are not able to dis describe it in some uh, uh, distribution. But yeah, it's unpredictable. I, I, it seems that this is pretty similar to something which is called relia reliability and then has this thumb breaker and <laughs> reliability theory where you can uh, predict when the given part will be somehow destroyed or, or, or ready to be um, exchanged. And you're talking about case, predicting yeah, how wrong case, I measured. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly, but they are using a Python distribution to... to Fazon is certainly better, that's true. Yeah, <coughs> and, and this is the way how you can, how you could maybe, maybe not counter, but you can get some, some assumption about the traffic. I would say so. It's better, but still wrong. Oh, yeah. If you didn't measure at this percentile, you're, you're making up numbers. And making up numbers is not the real system because these numbers are usually the worst performance you had. And if you missed the worst performances, uh, yeah, whatever you make up, okay, and it's unpredictable. It could be five seconds. Yeah, and it could be exponential, like like with the Scala compiler last week. Yeah, I mean exponential, whatever. If you can describe it, that's fine. But it could be completely random, super and spikes. I mean, yeah. the understanding of the numbers that is slightly different, that they should be understood in the statistics uh, point of view. So more like. Uh, yeah, that you're that very sure about it or less like sure that. about it. I'm not a big fan of this. Uh, you really need to measure the exact thing. <laughs> okay, exactly. There's a tool for that. Um, um, well, a tool for that. It's not really solving the problem, it, but it <coughs> allows you to notice you have the problem. Um, specifically, uh, you guys should check out uh, Jill Tennis. Uh, this is Azul as a CTO. His tool is called HDR Histogram, and it's specifically for measuring latencies. And it, it is able to well, detect that yeah, you're probably measuring wrong. It's basically a histogram, mm -hmm. a good one. We had one in the middle. Uh, like it's kind of related to uh, what we already asked, but uh, I'm also saying that uh, basically you stated that uh, mean and deviation is not enough. Uh, useless. To not even not enough. Useless. Anything. But this percentile plot, or uh, I think it's called CDF, or something like that, uh, is actually quite meaningful. And uh, basically what we want to do is to uh, have the mean as low as possible and reduce the standard deviation, right? No. Okay. You don't care about mean. Mean is meaningless. Completely okay. meaningless. Um, you remember we talked about if I'm above 200 milliseconds, people die. <laughs> you really don't care about mean. <laughs> Seriously. Your mean can be five, but then you have these spikes and people die. Yeah, yeah, but on this... Uh, mean is useless. The person I plot, it's, uh, like for, for events that happen like continuously in the time, and they kind of run them, they happen at random. So basically, that's what we want. We want our system to behave like quite uniformly. Uh, then those... Uh, those this plot, this, this percentile plot would actually be exponential, just like you said. Uh, isn't it like what we should aim for, or, or, or not? I mean, you should aim for whatever your SLA is. If your SLA means, on average, we need whatever, and we tolerate whatever spikes we'll get, okay, but that, that allows for 
five minutes downtimes, and you'll still hit the SLA perhaps because your normal response rate is five milliseconds. Your SLA is uh, 500. Then you have five minutes downtime, and you still hit the SLA. Yeah, but <laughs> if, if, if the is like exponential, the probability, probability of this five minute spike is like really, really, really small. You it's still like miss the SLA. Yes. All right. I mean, it depends. We are talking about high performance systems. If you're down, you're losing millions. Don't do it. <laughs> if you're a blog and you're down, yeah, whatever. Unless the blog is earning millions. Okay, maybe the well, last we're question. Time now, I'm afraid. Oh, I, was, I was going to give myself one more question because I had an okay. interesting question, but we don't have time. Okay. So, too bad. Good so, grab me on the corridors now, Adam, in this room about uh, how to actually build this kind of systems with Arca and stuff. So, you may be interested. Thank you.